Hello, and thanks for joining us for this complimentary webinar hosted by the FGIA and the NGA on the Embodied Carbon and Construction Calculator, also known as the EC3 tool. My name is Jason Seals, and I serve as the FGIA's Certification Services Manager. I'll be taking you through these introductory slides while Irma Lojoku Sol will be NGA's Advocacy and Technical Director will oversee the Q&A segment following the presentation. During the session, Phil Northcott, CEO of Sea Change Labs, will be discussing the full capabilities of the EC3 tool, including an introduction to the tool, project background, its scope and workflows, and an overview of the tool's functionality as it pertains to the to glazing and fenestration. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available online for on-demand viewing for the future reference uh, or to share with a colleague who was unable, unable to attend. Since we are recording, all lines will be muted for the duration of the session. A PDF and a link to a recorded on-demand version of this webinar will be emailed to you at later this week. Uh, we also encourage you to share today's webinar on social media using the provided hashtags you see here. Both association marketing teams will live tweet during the presentation, so check out the various social media feeds for takeaways. We will end today's webinar with a question and answer segment following the presentation, and we welcome your questions. Please send them in via the chat shown here by the red arrow at any time during the webinar. They will be moderated uh, at the end of the presentation. Our speakers today are Phil Northcott and Michaela De Rousseau. As CEO of Sea Change Labs, Phil leads an experienced team of software developers in the fight against climate change. This team consists of founding members of Building Transparency and the primary developers of the EC3 and its industry-specific customizations. He has been doing advanced R&D for 22 years, starting in telecom microchip design, then solid state drives. Sea Change is committed to providing the construction community with the tools and data they need to make climate efficient design and procurement decisions. Michaela works as a data and methodology manager at the nonprofit Building Transparency. Building Transparency aims to reduce embodied carbon dioxide emissions from the built environment by providing free open access tools and data needed for decarbonizing the, build, the buildings and infrastructure. As data and methodology manager, Michaela helps the functionality and data quality of the EC3 database and conducts internal database analysis. Phil and Michaela, we're looking forward to hearing from you both this morning. Thanks a lot, Jason. All right, let's see. Great. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on this demo and q and I'm going to talk first. Um, today, we're focusing on introducing you to the EC3 tool. Um, the Embodied Carbon and Construction Calculator, and with a specific focus on glazing and fenestration. And we're going to talk about um, the work we've done on a project this past year, really, um, to develop um, the ability to, to take a look at um, EPDs related to glazing uh, in the EC3 tool. So I'm going to do a brief intro to building transparency and the EC3 tool. Um, I'll give an overview of the, the work we've done for this project that I just mentioned um, to develop the glazing and fenestration category. Um, but I'm gonna keep it pretty brief so that the most most of the time on the on this call can be uh, for Phil to, to demo live the tool we've got. Um, and then we'll have some time for Q&A uh, at the end. All right, so let's get started. Um, I'll just start with a little bit about building transparency. We're a Washington State nonprofit dedicated to sustainability construction. Um, and our core mission is to provide open access data and tools necessary to enable broad and swift action across the building industry to reduce embodied carbon um, um, and its role in climate change. So kind of the primary um, advantages and goals of um, the EC3 tool are that it's going to be free. It's free to use and open access to folks. So that differs from from other EPD uh, databases. Um, I suppose to be uh, make sure we're all on the same page. I shouldn't use uh, 
shortened terminology. So EPDs are environmental product declarations for products which report the um, environmental impacts um, for a specific uh, product. So really uh, kind of the primary functionalities of the EC3 tool, which may be of interest to you all, is that we have uh, essentially a database of EPDs. I'll, I'll use that terminology from now on for environmental product, product declarations. Um, and folks can go into the tool, sign up for an account, and you can do um, you know, a bunch of database searching, sorting, and visualization of supply chain specific EPD data. Um, we really primar primarily focus on climate change, so global warming potential, um, GWP. Um, and you're able to kind of uh, filter and sort from our database for specific products. And, and um, you can see material category baselines and set material category targets on top of that. Um, so that's one functionality. And then the other is our plan compare buildings, which Phil will also go into where you can, if you're on sort of the building design side, um, make projects um, and, and do simple visualization, visualizations of a project's um, uh, potential and realized upfront embodied carbon emissions. So you can see conservative baselines and then set achievable reduction targets in your um, and body carbon. Um, I just put up a slide of our partners. We're growing um, and we have a quite a level of um, sponsors across the um, building industry. So just a kind of a sample of folks supporting us since we are a nonprofit. And then what I think is a pretty cool graphic is this growth EPD availability over time. Um, EC3 actually has tens of thousands of EPDs, but a good number of them are concrete EPDs. So this is just to show you uh, the quite uh, drastic growth in EPDs um, in the database that are not just concrete. So we're seeing this explosion of a lot of um, um, building materials um, having EPDs uh, in our database. And, and then I'll give a, a, a bit of a blurb about where exactly EC3 is useful in, in terms of, um, uh, you know, during the construction process. Uh, so we're really uh, primarily focused in the procurement stage. Um, so folks can do embodied carbon assessments of their buildings, build up a building, enter in the actual materials they're using, do product to product comparisons, um, and then do tracking over time of actual realized emissions um, with our um, calculators. So I would say that's, we, we specialize in the procurement phase. And I'll move into now, uh, just giving you a, a snapshot of the, um, the work we did to develop um, the glazing and fenestration category for EC3. So essentially, as Phil will show you in a, in a moment, we have uh, a category tree that drops down into kind of um, a master format, generally based category tree um, for building materials. We're constantly expanding that. Um, and we had this um, nice opportunity to work with folks in this industry to um, improve our um, category tree and our ability to capture specifications for those um, products. So yeah, to give you a snapshot, this is this is an image of what it looks like in our um, database, but I'll let Phil do the demo. Um, basically, the project was this very iterative project process to decide what the category layout is going to be most useful, um, really hone in on the correct nomenclature, uh, and, and to outline really what are the critical specifications that affect embodied carbon for all of these different types of products. Um, we're also in the process of making calculators for quantifying embodied carbon of assembly products that are, are typically more difficult to have relevant EPDs uh, when they're really uh, assembly products. Um, and the, the really cool thing is we had participants across the industry um, from NGA, FGIA, and many company representatives. 
And we've had over 20 working group meetings since July 2021 to, to really iterate on this. So it's been a really appreciated effort from the, from the team. Um, and I wanted to just give a little um, thanks to folks we received guidance and help from. Um, this has been our, our working group members for, for a year. So thanks a lot for your help. And just to uh, summarize, I'm not sure if these slides will be sent out, but if they are, um, I have a link to building, you can go to buildingtransparency.org to make an account if you want to access the database. Like I said, it's free and um, open access. Uh, you just need an email and um, you can list your employer and, and industry and things like that. And then we also have lots of links to video tutorials on how to use the database and website, and we have a user guide as well. Um, future work and ongoing work um, is is on this project is uh, finishing off the calculators that I uh, mentioned before, and to um, essentially refine keywords to ensure that we are when we scrape EPDs or have EPDs uploaded to our database that the information is captured uh, as correctly and um, as quickly as possible. So. Um, I think I will, yeah, hand it over to Phil to give the demo. Very good. All right. Well, I'm Phil. I lead the development team for EC3 and then one of the co-founders of buildingtransparency.org that manages the tool. So uh, you can find us at buildingtransparency.org. It's uh, this tool is free, but it's not really free. What it is is it's paid for by this group of people who pay us to offer uh, free, high-quality, enterprise-grade services to everybody who's looking to reduce embodied carbon in the uh, in the built environment. If you don't already have an account, you can register. Uh, and you can uh, use your corporate IDs. Usually Microsoft will accept your corporate ID um, or any of the other uh, SSO providers that we already uh, provide. There's also a, a lot of information about programs here on the website if you want uh, to explore them. Uh, inside the tool, as Michaela pointed out, uh, it's a large database of environmental product declarations from around the world. You can see here a, a map of, of where those EPDs are uh, within the United States. You know, you can you can take and uh, Canada. You can see where uh, EPDs are sourced from. I will note that we've separated concretes and non-concretes because uh, if you switched concretes. Uh, we have some highly automated systems because the concrete people have been way ahead of the curve in terms of automating uh, environmental product declaration. So they have 10 to 100 times as many EPDs as any other industry. That is a, that is a trend that we see being very valuable to uh, lots of industries and certainly including the glazing industry. Europe, and you can also take a look at the breakdown uh, of materials um, by material type. And you'll notice that it's 85,000 concretes. The next uh, one down is at 3,000. So what is this for? Well, the first thing it's for is so that people who are investigating a category uh, can understand what their options are with respect to uh, embodied carbon of materials. What What is really possible? So uh, we've rearranged this uh, with the help of the FGIA members and, and the NGA. Uh, so we've got different parts that go into a window or curtain wall or, or fenestration system. We've got flat glass and processed glass panes. Uh, and then we've got uh, assemblies. Uh, you'll see more in the future about curtain walls and window walls and storefronts, which really need to be built out of a kit of parts. We we, we currently don't know of a way that, that people could generate EPDs for those, um, you know, that, that would be a reasonable number of EPDs at a reasonable expense. 
So you'll you'll be seeing more support from us in terms of helping architects and um, procurement people uh, uh, assemble those and evaluate the embodied carbon of assemblies in the future. So if you take a look at one of these, let's say process glass, you'll see a few things. Um, so the first thing you'll see is that there's a selection of properties that you can search by. And these were, uh, and each one has a definition you can see in the tooltip. Uh, and um, these were determined by working with the FGIA and NGA teams. Uh, you can also see geography here. So for example, I can filter for things manufactured in the USA. I could filter for things uh, within NAFTA or the EU. And then I do a search. So what this is doing now is finding every environmental product declaration that matches my search terms. Okay, that includes uh, industry EPDs and product EPDs. You can see in this case, I have found 10. And what it tells us is that in kilogram CO2e per square meter, because processed glass is done in, in per square meter, uh, I have a range between 22 and 50 uh, kilograms of CO2 per square meter uh, that, um, uh, that we've identified as processed glass, um, you know, depending on uh, what you want from the processed glass. Now, one of the things I could do is uh, I could remove the default search, um, which only searches for currently valid EPDs. So now if I include historical ones, you can see I get a bigger number. So um, that's a first uh, look at the find and compare materials. In general, when you're exploring this, almost anything you put your mouse over will generate you a tooltip that tells you what it is and how it's used, uh, including most of these things on the diagrams. And uh, there are always uh, these tour buttons that will bring up an explanation of what something does. Similarly, there's one here uh, for this entire page. Uh, it, the doc, so the result is the manual for this is largely built into the tool and we encourage you to use it. The next level up, it is where uh, people are doing estimates of an entire building. So this is a this is a real commercial building that's been anonymized. Uh, it has a full set of uh, um, uh, materials here um, for uh, core and shell. And you can go into any one of these. Let's say we went into this processed glass. You get this same uh, search form. You know, maybe let's say I choose this one as the actual one I've selected. You can see how it lines up against the industry. You can open any of these EPDs at any point and take a look inside it. So now you can see a digitized, uh, a scanned digitized version of this environmental product declaration. If you want the original, you can get it here with download. Uh, but you can see here's its category and this is where it fits into the equation. Um, one of the things you will notice uh, around every one of our uh, environmental digitized EPDs is uh, kind of the blue fuzzy bars. That represents the uncertainty in the estimate. In general, uh, we believe that uh, uh, what we have found in our research is that <clears throat> EPDs that report for an entire industry are less reliable than ones that are specific to a manufacturer, the ones that are specific to a particular plant, would which would have a particular electricity supply, are still more reliable. Uh, if they refer to a very specific product rather than a, a fairly general set, uh, that's more accurate. And most accurate of all uh, is if there are specific EPDs for the major inputs, uh, such as in the, in the case of processed glass, the flat glass that goes into it. The um, coming back to the building.
I'm just going to let this absorb the collection. Uh, you can get a wide range of charts and reports. So I'm just going to save this so I can generate a new chart with our new results. So uh, you can uh, get a Sankey chart like this. So a, with Sankey charts, the height of the bar gives you the total impact. Uh, as you can see, the shell is substantially more than the substructure in this particular case. The top indicates a conservative estimate, which means that about 80% uh, of environmental product declaration times quantities um, would, uh, uh, would give you, uh, sorry, our conservative estimate is that uh, this is the level of impact you would have, and that is based on looking at uh, the 80% of the EPDs. There are at least 20% of available EPDs that would get you uh, as low as this. So the difference between them is the savings that are probably achievable. Um, so we take a look at here's rebar, and I think I selected insulated glass units at some point. So you can see that the one I selected is fairly close to the achievable target. So that's a pretty good selection, much the same for uh, the glass panes I selected a moment ago. Okay, there's a series, uh, you can look at this organized by uniform format, by master format, uh, uh, or in the case of um, a Revit import by the Revit classification. Uh, and there's also charts that are des uh, specifically designated for helping you generate lead reports. You can also download almost all of this, either the entire thing as the billing Elling report, if you want to post-process it yourself, uh, or in a variety of other useful reports, including a focused lead report. Um, there's a lot more uh, that you can do uh, in this, but the, the core thing to realize about it from the point of view of a manufacturer is that people are going to be comparing um, you against uh, competitors uh, in, into, in terms of uh, what products have the lowest GWP. And so we, we encourage you to get your EPDs into the system. There is, by the way, no charge for putting EPDs into the system. This is a public service. All those things are already paid for by our sponsors, including some of the people on this call. Um, okay, so the next up, I want to talk about what do you do as a manufacturer? Uh, if, oh, I see we've got a couple questions. Maybe I should answer those first. Um, so I see, I think Phil, the oh, question yeah, that, that's, uh, that's pertinent right now, it's someone is trying to follow the demo with you. Um, uh, uh, and they're saying that they don't have, uh, um, they're only seeing, uh, certain aspects they're not having a, a full um aspects of it so that is that is true so let me quickly go through yeah. could go through this with you um uh so i think the um uh the questioner is says he that uh, they have a private account so a private account is one where you have not told us your employer uh or uh, and your profession and uh, unfortunately, privacy rules mean that in that case, we have to turn off a bunch of features, including most of the sharing and a bunch of other uh, features. All you need to do is put in your employer and uh, your profession so that we know that your contact information is business information, not personal information. Uh, and that will give you uh, access to, well, to a bunch more functions. Uh, there are some categories uh, including, um, so let's just, if you are a pilot user, you will be able to see, um, let's just go into openings and uh, glazing, well, or you can just do it here, openings, glazing, and you will be able to see, uh, sorry, <laughs> this new stuff is actually still in pilot. Uh, so pilot users will be able to see all of these. Uh, some of these other ones are not yet available to all users. They they still need to be released. And that will happen quite shortly. Um, okay. 
So if if I got to switch back to uh, talking about manufacturers, if you are a manufacturer, um, uh, now I've used the National Glass Association page, so I didn't want to single out any particular manufacturer, but uh, you can take a look at your profile and you can manage this. And the, the general rule is the first person who signs up uh, with the uh, with your um, web domain and their email address will be admitted as an employee and will be able to manage this, or you can ask us. Um, so you can edit information about yourself. You can also say, I don't, I don't think that's a very good logo. And you can grab a better logo and insert it like this. Okay, so in this case, I pulled the NGA logo from the LinkedIn page, which is usually a pretty good idea. In the tool, anywhere you see this logo, if you click on it, it'll take you to the organization page. This will also, this is also a place where not only can you see the people, uh, you can see any subsidiaries. You can also see all EPDs that you currently have in in, uh, in the system so that you can uh, find and fix. Um, another thing that is true, uh, and you can see this through the Manage Data tab, is uh, that, uh, here, let's just do uh, panes, processed glass panes, not processed glass, that's uh, float glass. Okay, let's just pick this one open. These EPDs are divided into a uh, manufacturer part, which is uh, the, the name, the classification, and all of the product specifications. You as manufacturers may edit any of that stuff. Uh, as um, only the program operator can edit the environmental impacts. Uh, all of this stuff here is, cap is captured in a new standard called Open EPD, which is a, an open standard for interchange of EPDs digitally between uh, databases like ours, CAD tools like Revit or uh, any of the Tremble uh, products, uh, Tecla, um, and uh, procurement systems. What, is it, what it contains is a description uh, of your product based on the search terms to find in EC3 for the category, the environmental product declaration, um, uh, including uh, as many phases as you have declared, the product category rules, uh, any description of the LCA that you wish to uh, put in, and then uh, who is responsible. So in this case, Vito Architectural Glass, program operator is ASTM International, the LCA developer is Sphere. It was verified by IEC, uh, and each of these can see uh, which EPDs uh, they are, are uh, you know, published as having um, generated. We can also, we, it's also important to note that we have um, geocoded uh, every plant, and that's really important for calculating transport from plant from the plant to the site, which you can only do if you know both the plant and the site. That's not possible to do when you create the EPD, but it is possible to do once you're actually analyzing a building. So that is all built in. Uh, and if you do see any problems with your EPDs that you cannot fix, or in general, problems with the tool, you should use this purple button at the bottom, report bugs and feedback. So what it does, it takes a screenshot uh, of this. Uh, it lets you mark it up if you want, tell us things about it. Um, and you can label it, for example, as uh, a problem in the PCR or the EPD and uh, describe to us what the issue is. 
what that lets you do is uh, we will be able to see not only what you could see on the screen, uh, but also the condition of your browser and so on in case there's, there's some kind of a technical problem. And you can express to us what you think is wrong and we can investigate. Our mission is to supply accurate information to designers, engineers, procurement people, and owners. Um, uh, we have no interest in um, boosting or, or uh, anti-boosting any particular product. Our interest is always in accuracy. I will tell you that there is no difference in uh, how we treat EPDs from pilot from uh, sponsors and non-sponsors, except that uh, in the case of people who participate in our technical working groups, they get to give us technical input uh, in order to make things more accurate, uh, which I think benefits the entire industry because accuracy is, is a good thing. Um, so that is, actually, maybe I should not have, have stopped sharing. Uh, let me just... Um, exit out of that. Um, so uh, that's a quick overview of EC3. Uh, this would be a good spot to go to Q&A if people have specific questions. I see one from George Thomas, says, I work with Clearview and manufactures a solar IGU glazing. Right now the EPD is out for verification. The embodied carbon is about 15 kilograms. Um, over time, there's a carbon payback. The time for payback is dependent on the carbon intensity of the local grid and solar potential of the location. Well, EC3's focus is on body carbon. There's a, is there a method to designate the embodied operational carbon intensity or payback of a listed material in EC3? So uh, I, have, I have half a good answer and, and a half a not so good answer. So the first statement is at, at a building level, uh, the answer is yes. We have a whole section here on embodied versus operating, uh, including the ability to uh, uh, factor in local generation. And it can give you graphs like this. Uh, this is a graph that's showing the embodied carbon at the beginning uh, and uh, the operational energy over time as the grid rolls off uh, or cleans up. Um, right now, we don't have an ability to in detail deal with use factors because those are really um, very dependent on you know, lots of local factors. So what we would encourage you to do is to either use our exports um, or our AP, open API uh, in, into a separate tool that does take those things into effect or if you have a suggestion about how we could work it in in a way that was consistent, we would be interested to hear from you. Hopefully that answers George's question. Phil, before you tackle the next one, I had another question that came in in the chat. And it says that we are a manufacturer and installer of unitized facades that utilize a wide variety of building materials, including glazing. These materials may evolve. Light gate steel framing, aluminum extrusions, sheeting, weatherproofing, waterproofing, um, metal cladding, and glazing. Will the EC3 tool have the ability to evaluate and measure unitized building envelopes that are fabricated by a variety of components? <laughs> the short answer is yes. The, the longer answer is right now, if you were going to produce something like that, what you would normally do is use the building planner. Uh, you, would, you would build an assembly. Uh, and such as, for example, here, I'm just going to create a, a new multi-material element. Okay. And I'm going to put in, let's say, five elements here. And so let's imagine that this is your, um, uh, this here is your unitized assembly. Oops, sorry. And the 
uh, and then you would put each one of your uh, materials in here. So let's say that this was calculated in square meters uh, or in, in some other uh, way that you liked, and then it's an amount per square meter, and then each one of these could, uh, you know, you can map it correctly. When you're done, uh, you could share this and other people would be, other users would be able to copy and paste it uh, into their building. Um, we're also working on some Revit integrations uh, that we think will, will help you uh, represent a, a custom assembly. Um, the, uh, and there is a third possibility, which is that we could come up uh, with a, a way of building one of these automatically and generating an instant EPD for that specific assembly. Uh, that last thing doesn't exist, but it's something that we could work on. Uh, and it's it's the kind of thing that we think is necessary uh, for EPDs to scale properly uh, for um, solutions that are essentially uh, custom made for each application, uh, but where there's a lot of important detail in the components. Did that answer your question properly, Brooklyn? Or actually, well, that wasn't Brooklyn, that was somebody else. Yes, that came in through the chat. Um, I hope it did. So like you mentioned, Brooklyn also had a question. How does yeah. EC3 take into account glass fabricators? Um, we see the glass manufacturers, but the glass typically goes to a fabricator prior to being shipped to the glazer and or job site. Um. So when we're talking about fabricators, we're talking about uh, cutting, cutting to size and uh, possibly putting um, a, a wrapper on it or, 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 he or probably he oh. treated and insulating. Um, uh, so the process where it comes to the process, um, uh, glass, um, PCR and EPDs. Okay. So what, what we have right now to handle that is um, the, uh, the openings, so for IGUs, uh, have their own category. So, you know, if you're making insulated uh, glazing units uh, with uh, gaps in between and multiple layers, uh, that those are their own category. Uh, and uh, we would uh, consider in that case, the glass that goes into it is a feedstock. It's an input. Uh, and uh, we hope you will use EPDs for the uh, uh, glass uh, in the calculation of the IGU. Um, I don't know if that completely, um, I don't know if that completely covers fabricators uh, or not. Uh, if not, I'd like to hear more. So typically the fabricators would be, uh, you know, if it's a laminated product uh, or, you know, it's like we've been discussing in our task group, uh, fire rated or um, uh, coated or, um, you know, heat treated types of yeah. product. And, uh, you know, just to say that it's being discussed uh, um, uh, and being worked on as well. Um, okay. So next, so, uh, Ivan asked about uh, curtain walls. So let me just um, pause sharing for a second while I pull up. I'll show you what we've been. So Tom Bauer has been really helpful. We've been working on a curtain wall builder. Um, so uh, let me just quickly bring this up. Oops. All right, resume sharing, here we go. Okay, so uh, our basic idea uh, is that uh, is to create a, a builder that's a little bit like this spreadsheet whereby uh, you, know, you can specify a curtain wall uh, and um, then it will automatically calculate the quantities. And then for each of the components, you can then map it in the normal way to an IGU, to alum an aluminum extrusion or whatever else the product is. Uh, and uh, this will take into account uh, 
you know, how many repeats you have and, and kind of what's on the end. Um, so this is where we're going. I'll, I'll show you what an example builder looks like right now. Um, let me just uh, create a line here. I'm gonna create. I'm gonna show you a one of the better ones, the slab on metal deck uh, builder. So this one is a slab on metal deck. There's there's a steel uh, corrugation on the bottom. It's filled with concrete, optional a uh, wire and mesh um, reinforcement, and then a topping slab. Okay, so. Uh, there's a variety of options here, you know, how much inefficiency is in the floor, floor the depth of the concrete. Here it says it's thrown an error because I made the, the, the depth of the deck too shallow. Um, and, you know, change the topping slab to, I don't know, six millimeters, for example, instead of half an inch. Okay, and it can figure that out for you. Uh, and then it will give you all the formulas for the quantities. Uh, and then once you generate that, you can come in here and refine each one of these, such as, you know, for example, you know, this should be 3000 PSI and it should be in Washington state. Oops, 3000 PSI. And you know, you can do all the usual things. So our objective is to do this kind of thing for a curtain wall, uh, where you can do each uh, um, each of the components. Does that, uh, did I answer that question? I think so. Um... Oh, Ivan says yes. So good. there's an, uh, um, another question from Frank. It says, it's good to hear EC3 has a tool to measure, I'm assuming it's embodied carbon, EC3 carbon. transport logistics, which EPDs don't take into consideration. Our unitized envelope also decreases embodied carbon by drastically reducing field ho hoisting and access equipment. Is building transparency or the EC3 software um, willing, able to help with a study for the reduction of gas-powered field equipment. Um, I will be honest, Frank, I know almost nothing about that subject. Uh, in general, we're always interested. In general, we uh, our, our experience to date has been that construction emissions are a relatively small portion. Um, but if, if you demonstrate uh, the contrary, and in particular, if you would be interested in in using our our new A5 tool, which is coming out soon, to evaluate that, would be interested in working with you. Um, uh, our A5 tool is fairly straightforward. It's just a quantification. Is it? It's really built for construction people to first estimate and later monitor the actual fuel that they're using, rather than uh, helping to do predictions. Um, uh, so that that's currently where we're at on that. Uh, but you know, you could certainly provide guidance to people on uh, how do you estimate the workplace um, uh, the workplace impact of your product in the form of a a worked uh, EC3 example. That would be a, a reasonable thing to do. Um, does that does that sound like a good answer, Frank? If not, we can probably get you and Frank uh, to connect and have a um, offline discussion. Yeah, and he says yes. So George mentioned for the EC3 staff, not necessarily a question, but a comment. NREL and the Department of Energy have a great solar tool. API PV watts for estimating solar by aspect, tilt, location, zip code, and related APIs with carbon intensity. I can give you a demo of the Clearview tool if you want to get some ideas on potential integration to EC3 for operational carbon offset in solar related building material. So maybe that's just a... Okay. Yeah, it's a good, good comment. It'd be good to follow up on that, George. Um, I think what ideally our case would be, how, how do we get these tools to talk to each other? Because our, our view of EC3 or frankly software in general, 
is that you're better off with an ecosystem that talks to each other than one tool to rule them all, one tool to find them. Um, uh, so, but we'd, we'd be, the devil is always in the details. I'd be interested to, to see what that is. So if you wanna, uh, you, you know how to get in contact with us. Um, uh, I, I'd be interested in, in knowing more about Clearview and we could, we could learn a little bit more and see, you know, what, how can we help designers with this? We have another question um, from Tom Cross. It says, you have steel insert in the curtain wall builder. Does that take into consideration the height and the flexion? Uh, height, yes. Um, I, I don't know about deflection. Um, so, you know, in terms of quantity, it does take, you know, height into effect. Um, but I, I don't know um, what deflection means in this, in this context. We, certainly, let's put this way. We we do not attempt to evaluate whether mm -hmm. a uh, whether a certain construction is structurally sound um, at all. We're only trying to evaluate uh, the embodied carbon and uh, illustrate savings in embodied carbon. Uh, but we are not an engineering calculator. If you have a good engineering calculator, we would love to make your engineering calculator export its quantities to EC3. Yeah, I think he meant with uh, wind load deflections and things like that when you're designing um, itself. Yeah, um, and, and we don't we don't do that. We would I'll yeah. say it again. We would if you do have one of those, we would love to take its outputs. Um, okay. Here's another generic question. What is the best way for manufacturers to get their EPDs into EC3 database? Is it automatic? Um, okay, so uh, we do automatically scan as many of the program operators as we both can and who will let us. But if you want to get your EPDs into EC3, uh, there is a section here, add EPDs to EC3, uh, and you can uh, import EPDs from PDF. Uh, what this will do is it will send the PDF to us. We will attempt to scan it and you will be able to see uh, the uh, current status of uh, every one of the EPDs that you have attempted to upload. Um, we are constantly working on our scanning of EPDs, but fundamentally what we're doing is document comprehension. Uh, using a mix of heuristics, manual labor, and a little bit of AI. Uh, so it is not perfect. The correct way to do this is for us as an industry to move to uh, all electronic EPDs, uh, for example, using the open EPD standard. Okay. Um, that is really, if we're going to scale sustainability, so that it's a normal part of doing business that's integrated with our QA systems, uh, you know, and all of our usual inventory control systems, those things should generate uh, the EPD data automatically uh, and have them in a, in a queue for verifiers to verify uh, and then automatically into various databases, including ours. Uh, that's the way to scale this um, to the level because the truth is we're gonna have to do a hundred times as much declaration and we're mm -hmm. not gonna have a hundred times as much labor available to do it or money. That's true. Um, another question, if I do a regional and specific search, sometimes there are no EPDs that are returned for my search. Why is this? Uh, we, we do a search based on where things are made, not where they're available. Because unfortunately, yeah. we simply don't know where they're available. Uh, so there are many materials that are shipped long distance where if you want to use a geographical search, you'll have to use a fairly broad brush, like all of NAFTA or even global. Okay. Um, another question, how do you ensure that EPD comparison is for equivalent products? The closest, so we do two things for that. Uh, and the short answer is we do the best we can. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's two things that we do, well, maybe three. The first is uh, if you really uh, select something too broad, like all of glazing, we won't even let you do comparisons. Uh, but let's take, you know, let's say processed glass. So the purpose of these search terms up at the top 
is to reduce the scope to things that uh, actually uh, do the same job. Because, for example, if you need a fire rated glass, it doesn't matter that a non fire rated glass uh, has much lower embodied carbon. Y you need fire rating. As we say, we can't guarantee to compare apples to apples, but we do attempt to avoid comparing apples to cucumbers. Um, the and that is very much dependent on on you, the manufacturers, going into your uh, EPDs and telling us, um, you know, what those properties are. Okay, because we will do our best scanning the. Uh, the pages, but our scanning is only so good. You guys know your products very well. It's unfortunate that EPDs don't always don't capture these currently in a nice structured format, so that we can know whether two products are functionally comparable or not. Um, but we we do depend on you doing that. The other thing we will say in general is that the uncertainties around these EPDs are real. Uh, and we do not recommend to users to assume two things where the where the uncertainties overlap uh, are actually any different from each other. Uh, and those uncertainties are real. They reflect the fact that uh, different software uh, uses different equations. People may not have followed exactly the same procedure. Uh, you know, one person might use, you know, uh, um, electricity for New York and the other person use the electricity from the USA, and those are different even though the plants were next to each other. So um, there really are uncertainties uh, around them, and we don't recommend people take as Bible uh, things that are, are, are within the error bands. Unfortunately, you know, in the past, the sustainability industry has not been great about showing error bands, uh, but we are trying to change that. I hope that uh, answered the question. I think so. I remember when when we first started working on EPDs and PCRs, uh, you know, it was said that the the error was a plus or minus 20 percent. Have we gotten a little bit better than that, do you think? Some are much better than that. Some okay. are signif still significantly worse. Oof. OK. Well, you know, if you just use generic aluminum, uh, you, you've got 300 percent lying wow. around. It can be triple. Uh, so. 600% if I if I want to be super extreme, you know, and go to some Russian foundry or something. So I should be happy with plus or minus 20% is what I'm hearing. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. 20 is not too bad on the scale of some of the things we've seen. As an engineer, that does not work well. <laughs> no, it does not. And I, my, my, when I first got into this, I had a bit of culture shock looking at the size of the uncertainty yes. bars. I'm used to, I used to four or five percent. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is beyond negligible number. That's right. That's right. You, you've got it. Yes. Yeah. So here's another question. How will the builder or calculators be beneficial? Um, would a product-specific EPD be better than a generic product or an industry-wide um, uh, data capture? Yes. So when you do a comparison of multiple things, uh, it's always a comparison of the value plus one standard deviation of the uncertainty. The more general an EPD is, the bigger its uncertainty value. So the system naturally favors the more specific uh, over the more general, uh, but not infinitely so. Uh, we, we favor it simply by the fact that it has a larger or smaller standard deviation. Um, in general, we recommend people be as specific as they actually know, but of course, early in design, it is not wise to assume you know exactly uh, what the product is, at least in some, um, uh, in, at least in some areas uh, where you're not asking for a specific product. And we are always interested in finding a way that people who are innovative and reduce the embodied, actual embodied carbon uh, of their actual products uh, get a benefit in the market because it is only what is procured, actually procured and delivers that changes what happens in the atmosphere. And that's what is, matters to our children. Awesome. Um, those are the questions that I saw in the chat and the Q&A. If anyone else has a question, please go ahead and put it in the chat or the Q&A. Um, uh, 
If not, I think we have a few more slides um, to wrap up. We have about five more minutes. Awesome. Well, thank you, um, Michaela and Phil, uh, for um, uh, you know just demonstrating with us today, and uh, also all of you online um, uh, to come listen in on this. If you have questions, Phil's uh, um, email is in the chat function. There, of course, you'll be able to see um, uh, this uh, information will be sent out um, with, within a few days, uh, and. Uh, you're welcome to see uh, both uh, um, NGAs, uh, like, um, let me see here. Sorry, all of a sudden my screen went blank. Um, there you go. Okay, so uh, the full program recording will be posted on FGI's website. Um, the webinar recording will also be available for non-member participants via, via um, Vimeo from FGIA at the address indicated on the screen. NGA members and non-members may also access the full program recording at the URL provided on the screen. Um, all participants will receive a, a survey following the close of today's webca webcast. We request that you give some thought to, to what the survey asks and provide your response. We review them all carefully and uh, um, participant input is important to our future programming as well. Some of the tentative uh, um, uh, FGI future webinars are on your screen. Watch for your email and continue to check the website for registration details as they become available for these uh, webinars. In addition, um, watch your email and continue to check the website for these NGA webinars um, coming up on September 7th. That's going to talk about the impacts and opportunities um, of, of the Inflation Reduction Act and on September 15th with the Thirsty Thursday. Of course, uh, Glassville America, many of you will be there. Um, uh, it's, we invite you to join the um, glass and glazing industry in person at North America's largest industry trade show, um, uh, which is Glassville America. Network with potential glass and material suppliers, learn about new technologies and products coming um, to the market and discuss solutions um, uh, to your pressing design challenges as well. Um, thanks again for all of our partic um, participants today, and thank you for continued support of both FGIA and NGA, and of course, uh, this EC3 tool with building transparency. Have a lovely rest of your day and a successful week. Thank you.